IRB. All right. Let so um, at this point, I'd like to discuss the concept of an IRB application. As you learned through your city training, that in order to, to do research, your research study must be approved by an institutional review board before you can collect any data. Now, what I will tell you is that there are caveats to this. If you are collecting data as part of a class and you don't intend to present the research outside of that class or publish the research outside of that class, you don't technically need to submit an IRB approval. However, I believe that it's essential, even though this IRB is a technical skill um, and you're not going to need to submit it beyond me, I think it's a skill you need to learn, especially if you're going to do an honors thesis or if you're going to go to graduate school, because then you'll have to do a thesis. So it's my job to teach you about the IRB application. And the IRB application and the IRB process is so important to me that the application itself is 10% of your grade. Right? So you probably will notice that this is weighted very heavily on your grade. And as a function of that, I, I'd like to spend time addressing it. And I'm going to go through each section and I'm going to remind you things you learned from your research ethics lecture, as well as the uh, city training. And explain why they're asking it. And I'm not going to tell you all the time what to put in a section, but I will give you guidance on each of the questions. So every gray box must be filled in. Now, what I, what I have had in the past is some students express frustration with this Word file because it's macros enabled but sometimes it doesn't work. So if there is a section that doesn't work, attach an additional word file and say, see attach word file and include that as part of your submission. So let's get started. And for my own sake and perhaps some of your sake, I'm gonna make it a little bit larger because my vision isn't what it used to be. So let's start with a title of the project. The title of the project is whatever you think would be appropriate for your research questions. Now, each of you have submitted your three research questions. So remember when I asked you to come up with a general topic? That is what you put in the title of the project. Now, I noticed that some of you when submitting your research questions and hypotheses, um, you're kind of skimpy in this area. Now's the time to put the title of the project. And the same APA rules apply. A good title is about 12 words or less. Now I've seen in articles and I've cheated in articles using titles that are longer but your title should be 12 words or less or fewer technically because it's countable. Um, in the title, you should give the reader a sense of what your independent variable is, your dependent variable and the population. So um, let's, and I'm, making this up based on my dissertation. Substance abuse and religiosity in a Jewish sample. That was what my dissertation looked at. I looked at substance use in the Jewish community because it's a taboo. Now, 
that's fewer than 12 words, right? And it tells you the variables of interest that I'm studying. And it tells you the population of interest. Now you can be more elaborate than that. Um, I didn't use all 12 words. So um, be, feel free to, to be more elaborate. The cute titles that um, uh, we use um, in everyday life technically violates the rule. You should have your independent variable, your dependent variable, and the population of interests. And that all should be in 12 words or fewer. So that's the title of the project. Now, I my, myself, I've had titles of articles I've published with longer than 12 words, but you really shouldn't do that. Uh, Vanessa, you had your hand up. Do we all have to have the same title of the project when we submit this? No, you do not. And in fact, the IRB application, you are not going to be working as a group on. This is sort of my way of testing how much you know about research ethics before you collect data, right? So you did the city training, so you should know how to answer all of these questions. So no, you do not, you are not meant to work together on this project. So is that clear? That's such a good question what Vanessa asked, right? So, uh, Beck, can you erase the line? Um, thanks, dude. Um, um, you could actually note, you can actually doodle on it, but now's not the time to doodle it. But uh, so everybody's gonna have their own IRB. Good, individual. Now, some of the items will be the same, like your research questions and hypotheses, that's gonna be the same. The PI, principal investigator, that's your name. You are considered the principal investigator or the lead of the study. So you're going to put your name there. This also allows me to know who's submitting what, right? So you're putting your name on your paper. Now, the PI, uh, what's your relationship to CUNY? Are you asking? I'm asking, yeah. <laughs> Crystal, what? Is that CUNY student or postdoctoral? Yeah, um, you are a CUNY student which is a group that is entitled to submit IRB applications to CUNY, right? So you're a CUNY student. Now, you are also required, if you were to submit this, to have a faculty mentor. Uh, I would have been the faculty mentor on your work. All right, so now, section two of the IRB application, again, Framing the 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 uh, the study. So um, your research questions and objectives. So in um, research uh, overview description of the project part A, you're going to have one sentence that you're likely going to recycle for your intro. The purpose of this study is to dot, 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 right? Whatever that, whatever the purpose of this study is, make that sentence. And that's gonna help you with the intro later. Then it says that they want your research questions. Here is where you separate out your research questions from your known alternative hypothesis. So in addition to that statement that says, the purpose of this research is to dot, 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 you're going to state research question one and whatever the question was. Research question two, whatever the question was. Research question three, whatever the question was. 
Is that clear what you're doing on uh, section 2-1A? Can that be put in bullet points? It could be put in bullet points, absolutely. Now that's a good point. You asked the question. In the previous discussion, we talked about the annotated bibliography, right? That needs to be an APA style. This does not necessarily need to be. So the IRB application, you could use bullet points or, or numbers, one, two, three, whatever it is. Uh, you can do that. Uh, or you could have it written a sentence. In research question one, I ask, quote. In research question two, I ask, quote. And you go through all of them. So you can do it as bullet points, you can do it as a paragraph, whatever it is. Now, I am gonna read each of these. I wanna make sure that you got it, right? Now, your major hypotheses, here's the deal. For section two, one B, you're only reporting your research hypothesis or your alternative hypothesis. So you're, when it says major hypotheses, for the IRB, you don't include your null hypotheses. So in research question one, I hypothesize that dot, dot, dot. In research question two, I hypothesize that dot, dot, dot. Whatever your research or alternative hypothesis was, that's what goes there. Are we good? Yes, no, talk to me. Yes. Okay. All right, because when I have the full screen, um, when I'm sharing it, I can't see any faces. And most of you are boxes anyway. I can't see whether we're good. So uh, I want to do a checkout before I move to the next piece. Now, uh, research uh, overview 1C is your proposed design. So what is our design? We're going to have a combination of two designs, all of us, by virtue of how we collect the data and how we analyze the data. How are we collecting the data? Surveys. Surveys, right? So can we all agree that at a minimum, uh, in this study, I will be employing a survey research design? So I'm giving you that answer. However, we all have a second one. Now, and that's tied to how you analyze your data. Now, there are different designs that you could be using. You could be using a case study design. You could be using a correlational design. You could be using a true experimental design. You could be using an IV by PV design. You could be using an ex post facto design. These are the common designs. And you learned about all of them in 201, am I right? Yes. Okay. What happens, how many of you don't know everything I listed? It's okay. All right, so uh, so I have at least one person that doesn't know something. So let's break it down. A case study is a design where you do an in-depth analysis of an individual. Are we using a case study? No. No, right? We're we're putting aggregate data together. A correlation, a correlational design is used when we link uh, scores on one instrument or part of an instrument with another instrument. Now, both of the instruments must be interval or ratio data in order to use a correlational design. Good. A true experimental design is where you manipulate an independent variable 
and you measure the effect of your manipulation. And IV by PV design is a form of a factorial design where you have one factor that is an independent variable that's being manipulated and another factor that is a PV or participant variable. The participant variable is usually categorical, things like gender, ethnicity, and whatnot. And then an ex post facto design is a design that mirrors an experimental design, but you're not randomly assigning people into groups. You're putting people into groups based on pre existing categories. So if you were doing analysis across gender, right? Males versus females, you're not manipulating that, right? You're, people come in with a gender, right? And by the way, I'm aware that there's more than male versus females, but that's just a simple an, an example. Um, but that would be an ex post facto design. If you're looking at ethnic differences, um, white, black, Hispanic, Asian American, and so forth. Well, you're not manipulating ethnicity, are you? So if you're comparing group differences, but people are self-selected into the group based on uh, a category that they belong to, that's an ex post facto design. Now, spoiler alert, I went through many of the examples because different groups are employing different designs. So you have to figure out which one is most applicable to you. And I'm not gonna tell you that answer, right? Um, so that would be the design section, right? All right, rationale and justification for the study. This is gonna come right out of some of your research, right? So if some of the research suggests that there's a problem and you're trying to address that problem, you could use your three Ds from your thesis statements in this section, uh, or you could use some of your supporting research that you have from your annotated bibliography for this section. But here is where you actually have to build a case for um, why this study is to be done. So now let's go to uh, part two, number two, where it says the expected duration of the study. How long will you be in my class? Three months. Right, so hopefully if you're, if you pass the class, you should be done by the end of May. So the duration of the study would be as long as you would be involved in this process of collecting data, or analyzing data. So practically speaking, after the class ends, you have no right to continue data collection, right? Without the IRB. So the duration of the study you could put three months there, right? So that is fair, right? Because we're beginning March and we go all, all the way to the end of May. Now, why did I say the duration of the study? Because that's the full study from beginning to end. N then in part uh, two, number three, it asks, well, what's the expected duration of the subject participation? And what this question is asking you is how long will it take for participants to complete your survey? And that's gonna differ from person to person or from group to group, I should say, right? Does that make sense? So you give an estimate of how long it might take. And the longer the survey is, the longer it should take. The shorter the survey is, the shorter it should take. So I can't give you, without knowing what instruments you're gonna use, 
I can't give you an answer to that, right? So that's something that once you settled in as a group on your instruments, then we could talk about it, right? Now, I did ask last class for you to find instruments, right? How'd that go? Did you, did you do that assignment? So if I ask you, um, Susanna, name one of the instruments you're gonna use for your group. Wait, can I look at it? Because I, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm, this isn't a memory test. This is- Okay, yeah, just give me one second. Let me pull it up and I'll start. Okay. So your, your group is gonna have to decide on the instruments. Now, what does that mean? Before you can submit your IRB application, you as a group need to decide what instruments you have. Now, um, let me see something. I also wanna go back to when that is due. Let me go to see if we're timing it correctly. So um, we should be fine. We should be fine because actually uh, I'm covering on Tuesday all of this. So Thursday, we could spend some time putting you in your groups and locking in your instruments. And I could do what I did with the research questions and saying, yeah, that's a good instrument. No, that's not. But um, your IRB application would be due a week later. So you need to know what instruments you're using for that purpose. Is that clear? So from this point, you have a week and a half for your IRB to be done, due. Next class, I'm gonna carve out some time to finalize your instruments. Susanna, yes. Okay, so uh, one of them is the duty E. Good. The abuse, yeah. Right, so that's, that's gonna be important because when a, it's gonna ask you about your instruments, you need to know which ones you're using. Right, Hussam, you had your hand up. I was gonna ask. Um, I can't get access to the CSI library psych test po portion because my slash is the the account is not working. So, what do you think I, I'm gonna tell you? Figure it out. Not. I, I wouldn't be. I mean, that's the essence of what I'm gonna tell you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I'm gonna give you a suggestion. Uh, if your slash isn't working, please contact IT. That is not a problem that I can solve for you, but you definitely need to, to, to sort it out before things become due, right? So I can't, I, I certainly can't, that's not something I can resolve for you. Um, all right, Vanessa and then Dina. No, I, I feel like this is a stupid question, so never mind. No, there are no stupid questions. That was the first thing I said. Um, Because we touched base last week and you were like the, the people that are doing um, the religion, we can use like the Association of Religious Data Archives. That's not an instrument though, right? No, I actually said that would be good for your intro. Okay. It's not going to be an instrument. No, that's good. Okay. I just want to know a lot of you. I to figure out why you said it. Yeah, yeah, there, there's a lot of good stuff there, but it's a database, right? They have like large scale data, population studies, you know, in different groups, what their religious um, makeup is, things like that, some really cool stuff. Uh, and it could be useful for your intro. It's not a journal article, but somewhere maybe in your thesis paragraph, you can use ARDA, right? Um, Ari. Um, the question I had was, um, if this is going back to the annotated bi bibliography, when we're looking up articles um, for references, can we also choose articles that aren't exactly related to the question, the research questions, but um, are relevant to like the supporting research? So since we're doing um, pandemic, and um, for example, one of the questions is pandemic and the racial achievement gap, can one of the references be just exploring um, theories behind why the racial achieve, uh, 
um, achievement yeah. gap yeah. exists? Yes. Okay. Beautiful question. If an article touches upon even one of your variables or the population of interest, you can use that article. That is a good, because if, and Ari, watch this. If the study was done on racial achievement gap, post COVID, then they're doing exactly what you want to find out. Why would you do that study? So the answer might already be known, right? So in, in most articles, they, they might be talking about only a portion of your topic. So if you're talking about racial achievement gap, there's tons of ed psych articles out there on the, the racial achievement gap. Right now, what you're doing that's novel, hint gaps in the research, right? Is you're applying whether it's exacerbated post COVID, right? So that's that's the, the new thing. Does that make sense? So it doesn't have to be an exact answer to your research question. If there are articles that are an exact match, you certainly want to touch upon them. You certainly want to use them, but I don't want you to think that you have to find articles that are related specifically to COVID-19. You know, you know why? Because many of those articles aren't even published yet. They're, they're going through peer review now. So by the time you need those articles, they may not even be out yet. So you, you can touch upon, you could use articles that touch upon even one of your variable, it's good. All right, more to follow on that. Let's go back to the IRB. Um, all right, so all relevant factors. If you um, can think about the kind of questions you're going to ask, then you want to address it. For example, one question was about racial achievement gap. Well, one of your relevant subject groups are racial and ethnic group communities, right? Uh, both uh, the Caucasian majority and racial and ethnic minorities. Does that make sense? So that would be uh, your category. Now, are you gonna be doing research on children? Alex, are you gonna be doing research on children? No. Why not? That is the correct answer, by the way. Why not? Wouldn't it be like too lengthy to go through all that? No, it's not about lengthy. They're a protected population. Okay. Right? You don't want to use any population that's considered vulnerable or subject to uh, being taken advantage of. So children, prisoners, expectant um, mothers, people who are pregnant uh, and so forth are vulnerable populations. You are going to target healthy adults. That's your focus, right? So that's very important to, to say because if you're submitting an IRB application, you wanna make sure that it's safe to do your study. So anything that's relevant uh, you want to talk about. And then when you think about it, you want to do a breakdown. If you're doing um, gender, right? How many males do you want in your study? How many females do you want? And so forth. Uh, and then in your total study, how many participants will you need? Now, let me help you out with a formula for our participants. Um, in general, the justification uh, of a study, if you want to have adequate power, you typically need about 200 participants. Now, is that how many participants I said you should get? No, I said you should collect, you know, a minimum of 20 per person. Um, 
to a minimum of 100 participants. And if you're in group five, I still need you to collect 100 participants, I'm sorry. But typically, if you were gonna actually um, do this study for publication, each, each group or category should have, I use a conservative estimate of about 50 participants per category. Um, and that will help you with your sample size. Now on a lower end, 20 to 30 participants is adequate, right? So uh, if you use my number of 50 per category and you are just comparing males to females, how many participants would you need? Forty. Using well, it's fewer than fifty, which was my number. <clears throat> so that can't be right. How many categories are there? If I said you're comparing males to females. Oh, so a hundred. Precisely. Okay. It's just fifty times two. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. No, I no, thought no. I, I thought you meant like uh, I said forty because I thought you said if you were and you were saying you guys got to do twenty. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I understand why you said it. But, it, you know, typically that would be. Now, um, if you have three groups using 50, how many would you have? 150. 150. Now, with correlations, we typically use 200 participants, as I said. Um, so the number would differ based on what you're trying to do. Now, you're not going to have that, or you may have it. If you're ambitious enough, you might get 200 participants. Don't call it off if you're getting it. But uh, at a minimum, you're going to have 100 participants, right? And you need to have a justification why you're going with 100 when technically you might have needed 200 or more, right? So you need to justify why 100 is okay. And there are answers to this, but the one answer that is not correct is because Professor Kaplan said 100. Because if if it's because I said so, then I'll I'll tell you to do 200 as a penalty, <laughs> right? So <laughs> you might want to think of um, a, a reason why this would be okay if it's just 100, and that's going to require you to go back to some of the things you learned in 201, right? Uh, that one I'm not going to give you the answer to. So notice how I'm going through all of this. And so far, there have only been two questions that I'm like, I'm not telling you the answer. I'm going through it, but I really want you to think about it as well. Now, um, check all that apply. Are you going to be targeting non-English speaking individuals? No, right? Um, is it possible that you might get some people who their native language is not English? Sure, but you're not focused specifically on non-English speakers. So not relevant. Are you collecting data on CUNY employees? No, right? So all of this that if you check this, you would have to answer is just not applicable. So in the gray boxes, just do N slash A for not applicable. Are you going to collect data from CUNY students? Yes, right? Um, not exclusively, but some of your people you're gonna ask in other classes, hey, can you fill this out for my experimental class. Now, are you involved in teaching those students or grading them? No. 
So are you, do you have a power differential over them? No, right? So uh, you're gonna click no, and then the rest is gonna be not applicable. Are you targeting children? Alex told you no. And the reason Alex said was that they're a vulnerable population, right, Alex? Correct. Sure, okay. Uh, you're not targeting prisoners. You're not targeting pregnant uh, women. You're not uh, targeting cognitively impaired individuals. And the reason why you're not doing this is that each of these groups are vulnerable populations and you wanna make sure that the study you do for a class, you're not hitting on things that could potentially cause serious harm, right? So you're not, the good news is your studies are not tapping into any of that. And even though you're tapping into CUNY students for some of your data, right? Some of your data is gonna be CUNY students. Some of your data you might get off of your social media right? Unless you're studying students exclusively. So there's one group that's doing an education-based one, then you only can collect through CUNY, right? They have to be students. Um, but for the rest of you, you might use social media. Now, what's your rationale for your inclusion, right? So your, your goal is to protect the public. You want a, the lowest risk profile as possible. And uh, your rationale for exclusion is you want to avoid targeting vulnerable populations, right? Now, where are you collecting the data? Where are you collecting the data? This, this is not a trick question. Our homes. You're going to people's homes? Oh no, our homes. Our homes. Your homes. Okay. Uh, so that's not the subject's home, that's the researcher's home. Where are the subjects going to be when they fill it out? At their homes? Maybe. I don't, I don't, I don't know. You don't know, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so this is when you're doing a study. If you know a direct location, like for example, many of us have research labs on campus. So people would go to our lab to fill out the study. Uh, but what you're doing is an online survey, isn't it? And because it's an online survey, that's all the information. Um, the, it is an online survey conducted where the participant can complete it at a location of their convenience. See how nice that is, Hussam? They could fill it out anywhere they want. Sounds, nice. Sounds good. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth, right? That's the best way. So how are you gonna recruit them? So by the way, what you write here in subject identification recruitment also is relevant to your procedure section of the method. Write that down, ignore me uh, for the time being. Say, have Dr. Kaplan come back to that point at a later point in the, in the semester. Your recruitment is part of your procedure section of the method. So you're gonna have to uh, work as a group and decide how you're gonna collect the data, what your strategy is. If you're asking people to uh, fill it out online through social media. Will you have a blurb, a uniform blurb for them to, to read? If so, you know, you have to note that, right? So talk about your procedure. That I can't tell you. You have to decide as a group how you're going to collect the data and how you're going to advertise, whether it's through flyers or brochures. You might do that, I'm not sure. Are you gonna pay for a television ad? Probably not. A press release? Probably not. Uh, broadcast emails, guess what? When you put it on your uh, social media or you email people in your um, classes, 
these are considered broadcast, uh, pardon me, when you email the members of your classes, it's broadcast email, but they actually have website posting. So if you're gonna post it on your social media, you're gonna need to click broadcast email and website posting. And you're gonna explain the group that you're sending the email to, right? And then your website, uh, don't give me your, I don't wanna know your Snapchat, your Instagram, your TikTok accounts. I don't need any of that. Just state if you're going to recruit using Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok. Yes, I know what TikTok is. <laughs> All right. Um, but you would explain that in person, you're not doing any in person. Database review, you're not doing. Medical records, you're not doing. Record review, you're not doing. All of that, you're not doing. So what you're left with is potentially, depending on what your group decides, flyers, emails, and web postings. And you could use all of them. You could use some of them. You have to decide as a group how you're going to do it. Any questions on that before I move to the next section? Okay, so I'm gonna move on. Next, you're gonna do screening. So how do you know that they're gonna be eligible to fill out your survey? For those of you who are doing a survey on college students, if you put it on your social media, how do you know they're actually college students? You ask. So that would be a screening question, right? So if you have a requirement such as them being college students, then you have to use a screening, right? And the screening would be internet screening, of course, right? That's gonna be on your consent form. Now, the best way to screen them is to have them uh, put on the consent form uh, questions, are you above the age of 18? Yes, no, right? If they say yes, they could continue the survey. If they say no, the survey's over. They don't fill it out, right? Um, are you a college student? Yes, no. Right? If they say yes, they continue. If they say no, it's over. Do you understand the information in the informed consent form? Yes, no. If they say, if they say no to any of your screening questions, it'll take them to the end of the survey. So they won't fill it out. Does that make sense? So that is what screening is. Now you <laughs> as a group have to decide you know what if you're doing screening and how you're doing screening but if you're doing screening it's going to be an internet screening does that make sense professor i just have one question um if let's say we can we choose both college student and uh non-college just people at the same age or whatever the age could be put i don't know what what What's your research questions? I don't remember them. So what were your research it's, questions? It's, it's uh, about the drug. Uh, it's about the, God. Uh, it's about the, um, are there differences in substance abuse mean score between those who are here to stay at home versus those who violated a stay at home order? Right. Like, so is that dependent on college students? Do people violate stay at home orders and not be college students or no? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So for your group, it doesn't seem like you're restricted to college students, right? So you'll recruit, you know, using classes, but you'll also recruit um, in other ways. Okay. Right? Hussam. And our topic is religion and the five big personality traits of religion. So will we need any people screening? people have to be college students? No, to they have don't. Personality? No. To have religious values? No. You got it, right? Oh, okay. So that's the, now I'm not trying to be condescending or snarky. 
I'm actually asking the questions you have to ask yourself because there are three other groups out there that have to ask the question. The right. variables I'm studying, are they linked to exclusively a college sample? If the answer is yes, then they have to be a college student. And you have to do screening for that. If the answer is no, then you don't have to have on your consent form, are you a college student, right? As eligibility requirements. But you might have other ones, depending on your research questions that you as a group have to decide. Um, but I know which group has the GPA question about achievement. I think it's okay. Yeah, so your group, you're going to be stuck recruiting college students, right? And if they're not a college student, they can't participate. Now, the question I have for you is how will you know that they're a college student or not? The only way you'll know is if you ask the question in the screening procedure, and it should be in a consent. Is that clear? So each group has to decide what, if they're gonna do screening, what questions they would have on their screening, if, if it's appropriate, and um, how they're gonna do it. All right, so outlining the screening procedure step-by-step step is pretty similar, including a timeline. Um, I would say the screening happens immediately prior to participating in the study, right? If you are doing it. Now, step-by-step, step, you I can't answer that for you because it depends on what screening questions you have, right? And the process for that. Now, uh, select the proposed informed consent process for screening. So what you're gonna do, um, it documented informed consent will be obtained, um, are included in main research consent document, right? It, so it's that third one. So if you're screening, that's the one. If you're not screening, then in theory, you would have had to fill out another section. Now, I don't make people do it. I just want you to know that if you're uh, requesting a waiver not to screen, then you would have to check this box. And your group has to decide if you're screening, and if so, how you're screening, and the the procedure, Vanessa. Um, why wouldn't we do the second one if we're trying to like, if they go on social media or anything, is that not considered internet-based? Um, well, it's doc technically, um, it is internet-based, but um, you're gonna have another question. Let me, hold on. I believe there's screening and how you're gonna do the screening and then the consent form as a whole. So this is specifically for the screening activities. I would check both to be honest with you because it's, it is technically internet, that's a good question, but it's also um, as part of the consent form. Good? Thank you. Very good question. Are you going to record identifiable information about the participants? So are you gonna ask them for their address? Are you gonna ask them for their name, their phone number, their email? If the answer is no, you click no, right? Now, most of my studies actually, you don't, you don't record identifiable information in the screening document. So maybe you want to, that's up to you. But if you're not gonna do it, you click no. If you do say yes, then you have a dilemma. Are you going to make it so that in the screening, it, it's clearly known who they are? Are you gonna recode it with letters and number sequences to protect their identity? Uh, or are you gonna do it uh, without identifiers or codes.
which is more anonymous. Now, if a participant is ineligible, are you gonna retain their data? The standard answer to this is no, there's no need to keep their data if they're ineligible, right? Um, is it possible for the screening procedure to identify a pos positive identification of the condition? Maybe, I don't know what you're going to ask. If yes, describe how you're going to protect them. So that, what I just talked so far is just screening. And I want to emphasize that because there's a whole section on informed consent, which is the actual form itself. Are you going to ask them uh, to agree to participate? The answer for us is we're all going to have an informed consent. So um, we are going to have a documented, and I guess technically you could do oral internet, click, click both. Um, and then you're gonna explain where the informed consent's gonna take place, how it's gonna take place. And the individual who is responsible for informed consent the individuals responsible are all the members of your group. So here in section 7.1b, you're gonna list all the members of your group. Will all adult subjects have capacity? So if you didn't click that they have cognitive error, cognitive deficits, then the answer is yes. And then the rest of these are not applicable. Nobody's doing longitudinal research, so that's not applicable. Moving on to research procedures. So um, again, this is step by step. Now we're going beyond just recruiting the participants. Now we're gonna talk about um, where, where they're gonna fill it out, how they're gonna fill it out, the process. So it's whether, interviews, surveys, records, audio, video. Um, <clears throat> so these are the choices. You're gonna fill out the survey one, right? An interview, you would have a series of questions, you're on the phone with them, or they might be face-to-face. -face. None of you are doing interviews, you're doing surveys. And then you answer these questions as appropriate. Who's gonna administer the survey? Uh, that's Again, all the members of your group. Do you intend to give feedback? The answer is no, right? So if you're not giving feedback, the rest of this is not applicable. Moving on. So all of these, you're not doing any of these. There's no deception and no biological issues or genetic research. Now we have to talk about risks versus benefits. All studies have risks, all studies have benefits. So the, according to uh, the Belmont report, there are three different types of risks, physical risk, psychological risks, and risks related to confidentiality and privacy. That's it. So now this section is gonna tap into the, those three. So for each of the uh, procedures in section eight, uh, uh, please specify all the potential risks, side effects or contraindications uh, and, and anticipate the end intensity or frequency of side effects. All right, so uh, I got a question. How many of you think your study has no harm whatsoever, no risk, right? Think about the questions you're asking. If you ask people questions, actually, let me start. Is there a physical harm linked to your survey? No, right? So we don't have to worry about that. And I usually joke it that the biggest
physical harm you have with surveys is a risk of a paper cut. But because this is an online survey, you don't even have that. I guess maybe carpal tunnel. Um, but so there, the physical risk is, is not a big issue. But if you're asking about mental health factors, then you could potentially trigger some psychological concerns that are lurking underneath the surface that they've been struggling with, right? So there is some potential psychological risk with some. Asking a person their religion background, would that be tapping into privacy and confidentiality? Well, what is the religion linked to? Uh, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by what is the religion? Are you asking anything that could potentially be damaging to a person of a faith? Um, no. Logically. No. No. Now, you guys are also doing the big five. So you're not even looking at pathological personality, right? No. So you're looking at standard personality. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible that people not knowing where you're going with the survey could be stressful? Um, the answer is yes. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, so that is the extent of your risk, right? As it relates to psychological risk, right? Um, so you wanna talk about how that's gonna be reduced, right? So one thing you could say is that your the survey is anonymous and if they want feedback after the study when in aggregate you're happy to give them aggregate feedback that could reduce the risk if you want for those of you asking mental health questions you might have to have a debriefing form that includes local mental health resources. So that would be how you would address the risk. All right. Now, notice that in risk classification, they have minimal risk and greater than minimal, minimal risk. Everything has some risk. Even the wonderful um, five factors of personality across religion, even that study has some very minor risk. But minimal risk is the kind of risk that uh, you might have that level of stress or discomfort, right? Um, through taking a test, you, right? So if I, uh, if I told you we have a pop quiz on Thursday, would that stress you out? Sure. So if it's that level of distress, then it's minimal risk. Greater than minimal risk is when uh, it goes beyond the level of discomfort that you might have in everyday life. Now, the example of minimal risk, if you were doing physical research, is stubbing your toe. So either stubbing your toe or a pop quiz as a college student. So if it's greater than that, you click greater than minimal risk. Now here's the deal. For my class, nobody can pick unknown or unsure. You're not allowed to. So you have to decide whether yours is minimal risk or greater than minimal risk and then provide a rationale. All right. Are you providing any therapeutic benefit? Are you providing psychotherapy? Are you giving them medication for a condition? If the answer is no, all of this is not applicable. Now let's talk about benefits. So when we talk about benefits, benefits can be um, material benefits, physical benefits, they could be psychological benefits, or they could be benefits to society. So are, if your study is giving a participant 
research credits, which you're not, but if you, if you were, that would be a tangible material benefit. If the study, they voluntarily participated so they felt gratification, that would be a potential benefit in part one. If the study could help address a real life everyday problem, that would be in part two. If there's benefits to society, you talk about that. Now, we separate out compensation because that in of itself uh, lends itself to coercion. So are you giving them um, money, gift cards? Are you giving them a raffle? If no, the rest of this is not applicable. Now, the more extravagant the compensation, the more the IRB would question the appropriateness of the study. So if it's no, then like I said, this is all not applicable. And if you're distributing compensation, how are you gonna maintain confidentiality? So if you're doing a raffle, then you need to have people uh, and their addresses to give them their, their reward. So how, if that's the case, how are you gonna secure their information? Well, for that, there are guidelines, right? It's an opt-in where they voluntarily choose to give you their information uh, if they're doing a raffle, right? And then the winner of the raffle, you know, uh, is contacted separately, right? But they have to opt in and then you have to secure their information, all the people opted into the rap. Which brings me to that other risk we didn't talk about, right? Which is privacy and confidentiality. So describe the mechanisms in place to protect privacy of the subjects during recruitment, consent, and research procedures. Most of my studies are completely anonymous. And because they're completely anonymous, I ask questions typically, are you above the age of 18? Do you understand uh, the information in a consent form? Do you wish to participate? Yes, 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 that's all I get. So at that point, I never have them sign the consent form because that links them to their answers. And if you're asking about drugs, if you're asking about mental health, you definitely wanna have an anonymous survey. For this class, everybody is using anonymous surveys. So I'm not gonna allow you to have them sign their name. And that in of itself solves the problem. Uh, so you, for one, for 13-1, uh, the answer is that it's gonna be completely anonymous. No identifying information will be collected. Describe the mechanism in place to maintain confidentiality. Not applicable. How will you store the data without identifiers? What will you do once uh, the research is done? You're gonna destroy the data. Everybody's destroying the data. Now here's the cool thing. According to the APA ethics code, you have to save data for three years after, pardon me, five years after publication, right? Five years after publication, according to APA ethics. According to the IRB, it says you could destroy the records as early as three years after you stop data collection. Now, my question to you as ethical psychologists what do you do when APA says, hold it for five years post-publication, and then the IRB says you could destroy it three years after data collection? Hold it for five. You hold it for the most stringent of the two. You always keep it for the most stringent of the two. And then you just initial all of that stuff. And then your, your IRB application is done. Was that painful? 
No, right? So what's what I like about having students do this uh, is, by the way, every assignment you do in my class, there's a rationale for it. But this is your opportunity to really make the your city program, your city ethics training come alive. This is your opportunity to, you know, and I, I did a, have a video on doing research ethics as well. So if you want to watch it, that's fine. I can't give you all the videos because you're not going to watch them all. But uh, it gives you an opportunity to have it come alive and think the way you would design a study for a thesis or for graduate school. So I'm going to stop there. Any, any actually, before I stop, any questions on the IRB? Before I stop recording, Hussam. I thought you were going to say any questions in general. I have another question that doesn't refer to the IRB. All right, Susanna. Um, okay, so the the title that we're going to put on IRBs should be the same title we're going to use for our research, right? Just double. Check. You can make up your title. It does not have to be the same as your group mates. Maybe. So we have an option to either put one title as a group or do different titles? You know what? Just to make it simple, I want everyone to come up with their own. Keep it simple. Okay. This is an, because it's an individual project, I want you to treat this individually. So don't rely on any of your peer information. Now, do we use this title for our research as well? Or not necessarily. This okay. is for the IRB. All right. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, it could be different. Any other questions on IRB? Or um, Mecca? Uh, I know you said that it's individual, but to some extent we're kind of working together, no? Like for- um... For the IRB application. Okay. The only things that you're gonna have together are your research questions and hypotheses. Okay, gotcha. But, um, sorry, isn't the the title, shouldn't it be based on what we're writing about? Like for example, let's say we're yeah, writing- of course it should be, but I'm not, because it's individual, I don't want you to work in a group. So I am saying, I recognize that it's possible for you, Susanna, to have a different um, title than Thagis even though you're in the same group. And, and you should, because you're not working together on this assignment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions on this? All right, so uh, let me stop the recording.